Talk is the tragedy of autonomy in the modern theater of liberation. Um, the format of the discussion will be uh, will have uh, a talk by Vasilis. Uh, he will speak about one hour, and then uh, the floor will be open for questions. Um, thank you that you joined, and yeah, <laughs> let's thank Vasilis. You. I would like to thank the Greek office of the Rosa Luxemburg Institute for sponsoring this seminar series, and Drs. Uh, George Souglis and Rosa Vasilaki for inviting me to contribute. I congratulate them for this wonderful project. I know how much work is uh, required, and they have done a great job. The title of the talk is The Tragedy of Autonomy in the Modern Theater of Liberation, and therefore I'm going to talk about liberation, I'm not going to talk about autonomy, and about tragedy. And there will, be, there will be some signposts in my talk so that you will be able to uh, follow it. <coughs> First, post-colonial self-determination in the 1960s. Since the main topic of this series of seminars is liberation, I shall talk about what was arguably the last period of liberation on a global scale, decolonization in the 1960s. During that period, many national liberation movements, especially in Africa, established post-colonial states and gained international legitimacy and of a politics of citizenship that would accommodate racial, ethnic, and religious pluralism was called into question as movements from below resisted and repudiated the majoritarian homogenizing and exclusionary tend to homogenizing self-determination, both of them manifestations of stasis, of civil strife. One was dissent. Does the right to self-rule include democratic participation? Get at you, quote, state concerns about instability fueled uh, uh, dissent and to have internal disagreement and demo democratic pluralism. The second uh, uh, manifestation of stasis was secession. Does the right to self-rule include secession accelerated in earnest? So too did worries that cascading self-determination claims within anti-colonial movements might lead to increased pressure for secession, unquote. To, to well-known examples of such um, attempts at secession was the Congo crisis in the crisis of nation building. The UN, with African members in the lead, repeatedly condemned attempts by secessionist movements to redraw the borders of often fragile multi-ethnic states, and it explicitly or tacitly authorized the Congo, Nigerian, and other countries threatened by such movements, exploitation, and exclusion that they were fighting in the first place has been pervasive among colonial writers and intellectuals. Moreover, and that's the crucial sentence, that disappointment and sheer exhaustion are not recent, but rather have been parcel of all revolutions from France, from Sorel, Luxembourg, Schmidt, and Gramsci in the early 20th century, to Sartre, Camille, and Merleau-Ponty in the 1940s, to Fanon, Aren, and Castoriadis in the 1960s, to Foucault, Habermas, Lyotard, and Unger in the 1980s, to Negri, Badiou, Mouf, and Ranciere in the 2000s. More specifically, I problem of the modern world. Kantian freedom means m the moral freedom of autonomy. Autonomy as self-determination, free will, will under modern law, 
will being a law to itself, will obeying its law for its own sake. Kantian autonomy is the collectivity be free and at the same time live under the rule of law. This contradiction makes freedom tragic. As we saw, this was the challenge faced by post-colonial states in the 1960s. The concept of tragic freedom has been central to critical philosophy from Kant to post-anarchism. Governance begin to impede self-determination. Above all, can freedom defy the rule of autonomy? And now we come to Friedrich Schelling. In the tenth of his philosophical letters on dogmatism and criticism, which is 1795, several years after uh, the first critic, thus we have a mortal struggle between freedom and destiny. To manifest one's freedom even though the loss of this freedom, through the loss of this freedom itself. That is, in Schelling's view, how freedom and necessity are reconciled. If Kant thought that a free will is a moral one, Schelling believes that a free will is a guilty one that maintains its moral integrity. Freedom consists not in the self-governance of autonomy, but in the futile revolt. My next section, therefore, is the, tra the tragic in political theory. Since the German idealists, the idea of the tragic has acquired philosophical authority and great thematic range. Um, David Ritchie, The Tragedy of Political Science, 1984. Christopher Rocco, Tragedy and Enlightenment. Uh, Bert uh, van den Bink, The Tragedy, whose Antigone, The Tragic Marginalization of Slavery, 11. Mark Chow, Greek Tragedy and Contemporary Democracy. It's a very long list, actually it's three pages, um, uh, that shows the tremendous currency of the idea of uh, tragic uh, um, uh, mobilized within disorder, but its experience, its comprehension, and its resolution. In our own time, this action is general, and its common name is revolution. David Scott, the anthropologist, the American anthropologist, says, tragedy as a way of thinking about the fragility of the project of founding freedom and the act that it has, by and large, eluded the modern aspiration to revolution. Tragedy is the price of freedom. The result is the tragic form. And now about the post-colonial tragic, since we talk about um, the tragic, you must know what to do with it. Liberation is epic, but tomorrows are tragic. David Scott, whom I just mentioned, suggests that, quote, where the anti-colonial narrative is cast as an epic romance, as the great progressive story of an oppressed and victimized people's struggle from despair to triumph under heroic leadership, Haiti have been often discussed in the context of the antinomy of autonomy. They were manifested from the moment of the nation's founding, notably in the authoritarian structures of governance established for the emancipated colony and young state. And I have a couple of quotes from Doris Garraway about Haitian tragedy. Yet if the Haitian project of emancipation proved to be a paradox, as paradoxical as that of the French Revolution, 
This was a paradox supported in large part by the very universal categories in which it was proclaimed, and that's the specific uh, Haitian paradox from the very beginning of the autonomy. They ultimately remained trapped within the logic of the very will to power that the public use of intersubjective communicative reason in the Enlightenment hoped to overcome. Nick Nesbitt writes, the contradiction between an absolute fidelity to the universal abolition of slavery and a defense of, on the other hand, in the free state, a defense of paternalistic military, agon, the tragedy of revolutionary governance. It dramatizes moments of extreme dilemmas. It dramatizes irreconcilable contradictions of legitimacy as contestation intrinsic to the revolution. Modern theater is rich in historical and imaginary figures and events pertaining to revolution. And here are some examples that we all know. Philip II of Spain in Schiller's so strong interest. We have in writings on tragedy itself, uh, Carl Schmitt on Shakespeare, Castoriadis on Aeschylus, Badiou on Racine, Tony Negri on Euripides, and of course Butler on Sophocles and so on. I argue that modern tragedy has as one of its central topics the ethico-political dilemmas of rebellion, namely revolutionary beginnings caught between limitless self-authorization and self-limiting rule. Tragedy stages the drama of the Greek archi in its double meaning of beginning and rule and asks whether self-rule may control itself, whether radical autonomy may limit itself. Evolved from a constituting to a constituted power, it reflects on what it means to institute a political community. At the extraordinary moment of revolution, collective autonomy is engaged in a new founding. A self-instituting society will be making now its own norms. But what, but what will their foundation be? The tragedy of revolution, of the absolute beginning and the possible justification of its groundless actions, dramatizes the search for the legitimacy of revolutionary justice. By staging an agonism of judgments, tragedy dramatizes the dilemmas of justice in a political society. Uh, and on the contrary, the view that generated a lot of, continues to uh, generate a lot of discussion is that of, of David Scott that I mentioned, uh, where he says that tragedy uh, uh, helps us implode uh, uh, the post-colonial, the, the revolution, the anti-colonial revolution and the post-colonial predicament uh, exactly because in, um, and traces the tragic course from solidarity and hope to despair under the weight of neoliberal regimes that seem to eventually prevail in the post-colony. Tina Chanter, in the book Who's Antigone, suggests that postcolonial dramatists have turned repeatedly to Greek tragedy in order to articulate predicament, must grasp the tragic patterning of the events that will have come to constitute, quote, our history. In retelling our history as tragedy, we come to experience our being in common. Um, in the face of failure of, of the failure of decolonization, a messenger declared, "We are in tragedy." And Anjuli Garanti discusses postcolonial writers who demonstrate, she says, the importance of rewriting the history of the nation as tragedy instead of as legend, which would be again a local um, idiom. 
She shows how they remember and rework the revolutionary pasts of postcolonial nations by translating mourning into tragic performances that bring Athens for the ancient um, Athenian uh, uh, tragedians, uh, Haiti has been for their work. That heterotopia, uh, that exemplary heterotopia where we can, where they can uh, stage uh, the drama of revolution and the antinomies of uh, autonomy. Haitian Revolution, the one and only, unprecedented, uh, discussed, uh, unfortunately, to a very limited, almost non-existent extent uh, last year in Greece, while it would have been the best uh, comparative um, uh, ground. Self, others during the postcolonial years. Uh, Errol Hill says, to African Americans, the Haitian Revolution seems destined to become what the Trojan War was to the Greeks, an inexhaustible source of heroic and legendary stories that will, for a long time to come, supply the raw material for inspiring black drama. Some of these three. Uh, C.L.R. James uh, revise, uh, rev revises um, an old play and calls it the Black Jacobins in 1967 and so on, tragedies in, in, in French as well and so on. It's also the decade that produces um, uh, Jean Genet's, uh, Jean Genet's um, uh, The Screens, produces plays by uh, Wally Soyinka, and so on. A great uh, uh, decade of postcolonial uh, writing. And now let's focus for a few minutes on Aimé Césaire, the Martinican uh, uh, politician and playwright, playwright <coughs> the total 20th century uh, intellectual, <coughs> you name it, he wrote it, you name it in the realm of activism, he did it. Uh, born in 1913, <coughs> died in 2008. And I'm uh, quoting John Walsh. Césaire offered and legislated a delicate balance between France and the Caribbean. He adamantly defended departmentalization for its extension of administrative rights and economic protection but clearly lamented the failure to improve racial and social equality. Departmentalization removed the inequities of colonial law and brought economic protection, but it was also a compromise that did little to improve racial and social equality on the island. So these are the antinomies. So here are some polarities. American, in the American hemisphere that best preserved practices and values of pre-colonial Africa that could be recuperated and disseminated by diaspora blacks in a pan-American, pan-African, post-colonial world. So Haiti is interesting both because of it is a modern ex post-colonial experiment, the experiment par excellence, but also a tremendous repository of pre-colonial Africa. He says, I love Martinique, but it is an, alien in an alienated land, while Haiti stood in my mind for the heroic Caribbean and also the African Caribbean. I connect the Caribbean with Africa and Haiti, the most African island in the Caribbean, is at the same time a country with a remarkable history. The final black epic of the New World was written by Haitians, by people like Toussaint Louverture, Christophe de Salène, etc. Césaire's engagement with Haitian history informed his strate strategic orientation to politics and his programmatic writings about 
through decolonization as a revolutionary overcoming of colonialism with indispensable political, socioeconomic, <coughs> cultural, and psychic dimensions. He took a formative trip already, not, he has been long in, in civil war, but it is now two countries, one country with two governments. Unpopular for the slave plantation, for the, for the slave plantation system, which he enforced during his, his despotic reign. His idea was, you know, now that we're an independent country and we are free to do whatever we like, w uh, since what we know best is to uh, uh, maintain a plantation system, well, it was colonial, but that, you know, that's too bad. This time it will be our own. So he imposed on his country, on his free country, uh, the uh, colonial plantation system, <coughs> which made him, of course, hugely unpopular, uh, became ill, and then fearing a coup and assassination, he commits suicide in 1820. That's the story that Césaire says in his tragedy. It's the rise and fall of King Christophe, uh, uh, the dictator. Um, In pursuing, and quoting uh, Wilder, King Christophe reminded its early audiences of several African new states that, having begun as democracies, they had rapidly devolved into military dictatorships. Moreover, Haiti itself had been ruled since 1977, when he started writing, had been ruled by the dictator Francois de Valle. Césaire, despite his fascination with Haiti, refused to visit between 1957 and 86, when de Valle's son and successor, Jean-Claude, was ousted from power. In King Christophe, Césaire shows us an extraordinary, capable, and initially well-intentioned well ruler gradually losing touch with his people and by the very means he employs to defend their freedom, becoming their oppressor. This brings to mind Césaire's about the problem of freedom helps point beyond the limitations of an anti-colonial nationalism and post-colonial criticism that, for understandable reasons, has largely focused on singularity incommensurability and untranslatability. Untransla Thinking with them, with him about his world and ours may be a step toward. This dilemma has been discussed often in tragic terms derived from German idealism. Among anti-colonial revolutions and post-colonial predicaments, Haiti has been attracting intense attention. Seeking to approach the antinomies of autonomy from a literary direction, I propose that modern tragedy has dramatized the dilemmas of revolution since the late 18th century, and I focused on the story of emancipation told by post-colonial tragedy. Returning to the 1960s, 60s, my point of departure, I found it remarkable that at that time, theater drew on revolutionary Haiti to write tragedies of liberation. I concluded by discussing a tragic historical figure, writer, public intellectual, and politician, M. S. S. R., and his greatest play, The Tragedy of King Christophe. I spoke as a scholar of literature and drew on political theory to explore the importance of post-revolutionary theater for discussions of the tragedy of liberation. And I thank you for listening. Like that it's the, the place of, of dilemmas. Uh, but yeah, in my, in my view, just to, to close it for now, um, these are not, are not necessarily inherently contradictory. I mean, combining uh, even ancient uh, Greek uh, terminology, uh, like tra tragedy 
or, or uh, like uh, from the era of enlightenment, all this is not contradictory necessarily to uh, freedom and liberation from the colonial rule. And in general, the, the different systems coexisting, I mean, different systems coexisting transitions uh, are known as such uh, since the era of Marx. I mean, it's not such a novel contribution, uh, even, even in the history of ideas that different systems coexist, like feudalism and capitalism, or you know what mm -hmm. I mean. And, and Gramsci also, I mean, uh, brings that. Yeah, okay, that's it for now. Thank you very much, thank you for the question. Um, <coughs> I can appeal to the universal ideal of independence to uh, separate themselves from the state. That's what makes, I think, many political scientists talk about postcoloniality as a tragic situation because they discover, and the other uh, 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 dilemma that I uh, uh, mentioned was, that they mentioned, was um, internal pluralism, democratic pluralism. How much freedom of opinion, how much dissent can we allow? And so, um, and how free can we be when the people who run the mines continue to run? That the colonial rulers imposed by the communists. And it would happen like this even if they were not communists. I mean, it's not the dichotomy, the dichotomy that matters, like rationalism versus, uh, I don't remember the other, uh, and yeah. Um, it's reality itself, that's what I'm trying to say, that, that by conceiving it in conceptual terms doesn't mean that we can change it. Only maybe if we, if we do radical changes, as you said, if we change the whole production system. That, that's, yeah, what, that's what I mean. <coughs> um, if it were as simple as reality itself, everybody would see it and act accordingly. <laughs> since people uh, uh, in the 50s and the 60s were so incorporates in a play several local and national and international elements and writes a tragedy that is not Martinican, not Haitian, not Greek, but really a tragedy of the, of the 60s the very literary um, composition of this work invites international cosmopolitan thinking, broad thinking, because he, he does ex an experiment of his own. How many different, diverse, incompatible elements can I put on a stage? Can I have a tragic hero and have a chorus that is, you know, and this is evolving. It's not, it, revol it evolves as we speak, nativism in, in India, for instance, or the emergence of Islamism in Egypt in the 30s, or something like that. Is it something, I found the idea very useful, and I was thinking whether this could be applied not only in the post-colonial space, but in certain ways, I mean, the whole world after, up until, uh, up until the, the end of the First World War is a colonial space. We've got mm -hmm. this distinction of the core of the West and the rest of the world is a colonial space. And that's why I like very much you know, the fact that the event of colonialism is constitutive in the ways we understand and we see the world today. So I was wondering whether, I was wondering whether we could extend that concept and to understand all politics outside the West, the fate of all politics. Do I have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> we can often bring it in dialogue with political, with dramatic political developments such as the revolution. In, in, um, 
the, 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 the best tragedy about, about the Greek uh, War of Independence is Kapodistrias, by, I mentioned it by Nikos Kazantzakis, which is exactly the dilemmas of the first years of, and the contradictions and the conflicts of the first years of, um, of autonomy. So I think uh, uh, it's an, an area where political theory and political history and it's tragedy to to look at the the dead ends and the adifaces the contradictions of contemporary movements even me too right i was thinking more of black lives matter <coughs> or of movements against different contemporary forms of racialization arab, arab spring arab spring precisely so Again, it's not really a question. I think that's what I'm going to take away from your talk. Tragedy as a lens. My project right now it has to do with uh, the Roma in Greece. And using it in various ways. And since then, uh, that's why I said I have you know, three pages of titles by political theories alone comes in the format of the genre of tragedy to dramatize that for all of us to see and generate well-known works. So, yes, we, for two centuries, we have been calling difficult questions that cannot be avoided or transcended tragedy. And let's keep the options open. And so the next time we have, we have a dilemma, we can not rush to conclusion, but still remain to the extent that we can uh, undecided. You know, the dramatization. Um, and something that popped into my head as uh, I was listening is that, you know, in all acting classes, they basically tell you that, you know, you have to get what society, not, not politically, or but the norms, I guess, and what societal structures have informed you in terms of behavior and how to uh, move it, 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 all the way down to the way you walk and look at things and think mm -hmm. about things. Um, and I guess what I did almost, um, yeah. yeah, that's what, what comes to my head. I guess what I was, and this might not be the best worded question, but is the, because from what I understood, it was m much more political factors that you uh, uh, touched on and I, wanted to also uh, hear what you think about more societal social structures m uh, getting away from the from the political if there's anything to touch on there that's yes okay <coughs> thank you that's a very useful uh, a, an actor's perspective is <laughs> very useful in any dilemmas and you do your faith will solve them and if you are not a monotheist, if you don't just subscribe to a monotheist uh, religion, then uh, very likely you are a communist or some kind of leftist. And so messianism, political messianism, will also answer your questions. So in today's world, we seek our answers in other areas and don't face uh, insurmountable contradictions. That was one um, uh, idea that uh, various uh, writers advocated. Um, I think at the, by the end of the century, of the 20th century, the matter had been resolved that by the number, of course, of tragedies that had been written that playwrights write works that call them tragedies and uh, critics in terms of them as such. So um, simply devastated. As well as Medea, Medea also because you can you you can see her point and you cannot be, you know, for her either, and so the works that leave you just totally at a loss, and hopefully you make you also say that's not theater. We don't go to theater for this, or make you say I no longer know who I am. And you described the the succession between uh, a, a revolution and a tragedy that, you know, this in modernity goes hand in hand, uh, they are together. 
And I'm thinking, you know, in historical terms, uh, I would say that, I mean, uh, it is, uh, my comment is, is based upon, you know, to what other people have said here, that historically speaking, from a historical perspective, is that uh, a revolution, I mean, for example, let's take, uh, you know, the example of the Russian Revolution, that is uh, the archetype of revolution, is that is, uh, it was, a it was a tragedy to a certain extent. It was the quintessence of a tragedy because, I mean, it was uh, limited, you know, uh, by external factors. So, I mean, uh, the revolution followed by counter-revolution. I mean, there was, I mean, and the, tra the, the, the tragedy was shaped to a certain extent, not only because, I mean, for internal reasons, you know, how people use the power and misappropriation, et cetera, et cetera. But also, you know, because of uh, a fact that was external and there was not really something was, they decided, I mean, there was not something they could control. Uh, and uh, and I'm uh, thinking, you know, uh, your comment that you argued that uh, tragedy, uh to the best of my knowledge, it has not, unless it has and they have not been translated. So sometimes we have, uh, you know, Elizabethan theater and Shakespeare and Marlowe and company, and you can say, oh, of course, you know, this is what's happening at the level of um, politics, religion, transition from uh, uh, Catholicism to Protestantism and so on, the economy. Um, but other times you have such turmoil and no tragedy for reasons that I have not explored, but I'm sure they have to do with how at that time theater was done, how it was sponsored, how it was financed, et cetera, et cetera. Theater is not just the playwright, it's the very actual reality of doing theater. And if the reality, the, the, the artistic and cultural reality is not there, nobody will be inspired to write a play just because. So, yes, we miss, um, uh, when we go to dinner, by the time we're there, I will remember two or three novels that were Victor Serge. Victor Serge wrote a novel about, which is comparable to, the great tragic, tragic no Russian novel is uh, The Possessed, The Devils. That's a tragic novel. And everything that... <coughs> Other people? Other questions? Um, I think we are finished. Thank you, everyone, for your presence today. Thank you. Thank you, Vasilis. Uh, one minute just to let tell you that our next session is uh, on 11th, 11th November. Our speaker is Olga Lafazani, and uh, we'll speak about the significance of border and migration uh, nowadays in Greece. So, see you in uh, two weeks from now.